I thought we could uh, we could start with just sort of a brief intro to Gumroad. Uh, sure. You know what it is, and and you know why why you believe it's important to make selling things as easy as sharing things uh, across the web. Totally, yeah. So Gumroad is a tool that makes it as easy to sell as it is to share. It's for any creative person. Um, we want we want to make it as easy to sell as it is to share. We want to take a lot of the the ease of use, the accessibility, the speed of sharing stuff on Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, and, and apply it to commerce. Um, I think, you know, I had the idea when I designed this thing in Photoshop one weekend and I wanted to sell it and I thought it couldn't have been that difficult. There were all these ways to share content and I realized like just adding a price tag to something is really difficult. So that's how Gumroad kind of came about. It was a weekend project that later turned into a full fledged startup, um, raised money from these guys and some other f awesome folks and, and that's Gumroad. Yeah. So, and I think there's a, a lot of layers in Gumroad, right? So yeah. in, the, in the limit, lots of successful companies sort of start helping people do things that weren't initially obvious. So mm -hmm. you could say, you know, Gumroad may help more people make more things. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about sort of that big vision and, and kind of how that narrative or how that's woven into, you know, the design decisions that are sitting right in front of you. Totally. Yeah. So I think... Starting a company was kind of a scary proposition because it would have been the first time where I would have worked on something for more like than a year besides kind of high school. Um, so that was scary because, you know, you can't start a company, raise a bunch of money and be like, I'm out six months later. Um, so I wanted to figure out if I could work on something that I, I felt was pretty core to what I, what I like doing. And I, I realized that I kind of got started doing, you know, making websites, making web apps, making iPhone apps and, and things like that because it was so scalable. It was so highly leveraged. Building products was really cool. I would much rather solve, you know, build an app that solved a problem over the course of some amount of time and then release it up to the world where it could help, you know, potentially millions of people um, solve their same problem. And I was like, okay, like, that's great for me. I can code, I can design, I can build apps. Apple has given me the tools to charge for these things, but it doesn't really apply to a lot of these other, other industries. If you're a musician, if you're, um, I don't know, a film filmographer, cinematographer, whatever they're called, director, you know, screenwriter, script writer, um, icon designer, it's really hard to sell anything that you create. So we just want to make it a lot easier. And I think if we turn more people into makers and we make makers more efficient at making things and selling things and, and earning money directly off of their creativity, it could lead to a better world for everyone. So, so is, there, is there an example of uh, a decision you've made recently sort of about the product? Kind of Maybe it's a, a prioritization. You know, someone comes with a great idea, but not now, not yet, mm -hmm. that you're sort of able to, to shelve and sort of say, we'll get there because you know kind of that's where the company's going versus just saying no? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, re I mean, I really say no. I think no is more of like a not now more than anything. You know, constraints, I think the biggest constraint is time. And you have to prioritize, otherwise you're going to get killed um, by, you know, your money run running out or no one wanting to work for you or not being able to gain traction or anything like that. Um, so, you know, one of the things we say no to a lot, even though it's it's pretty difficult because it's like, free money you know it's like if you build this feature we're going to sell this thing and you're like uh, it's not really right which is physical goods you know we don't really touch physical goods yet we're focused purely on digital goods and the big reason is because we're solving so many problems like just selling something has so many like little itty bitty parts to it that we want to fix those for a specific type of sale which is you know selling an icon selling a song selling a video selling a pdf things like that and then once we figure out a lot of these problems um then we can be like okay now you know we we flip a switch and now we can We've solved these problems already that also apply to physical goods, that may apply to ticketing, that may apply to selling your time or you know raising money for charity. Um, so that's what we do. We try to find the, 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 we try to solve the problems that apply to all of these things, but but kind of in the scope of of our constraint, which is which is digital digital content. Yeah. I think that relates to something we talked about before, sort of that your your concept of designers is sort of merging these concentric circles, you know, taking yeah. two circles and kind of getting them to overlap. So I think if you could talk a little bit about kind of how how you've sort of come to that conclusion. You know, you sort of no formal design training, but yeah. you sort of have been thinking a lot about design over the past you know, six, seven years. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I try to figure out, uh, everyone asked what design is, and it's, I think from all the talks, I think everyone said kind of like design is everything. Um, design is how it works, it's every, and, and so, you know, that's, that's true. So, but I, I try to get a little more specific. I, and the way I think about it is design is kind of trying to shrink the gap between what a product does and why it exists. So the purpose, taking the purpose of an item and trying to get what it currently does closer to that. So, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to apply to physical things because, you know, a coffee cup is made to hold coffee. So if it has a hole in the bottom, it's shittily designed. That's, that's easy. Um, but 
designing an app, designing a product, you have so many questions that you need to answer, where it's not just, there's, there's not just one use case to it. It makes it a lot more challenging, but that's kind of what I look at is like, why does, why does government exist? What is its purpose? And will this decision get us closer to that or farther away? Um, and, and that's kind of how I think about that, it. That process of bringing them together, the, yeah. the, the sort of, you know, the, the iteration, sort of optimizing something once you push it out in the world and kind of that, that balance, between how you strike a balance between, um, you know, the listening that you have to do once something is out there versus yeah. the, the creation piece. Yeah, it's tough. I think I cheat, which is I try to work on products that I use. That's it. I refuse to work on enterprise software, for example, because I'm not an enterprise. Um, and it makes it easier because while you're creating, you're listening because you're always thinking about a feature that you're designing as you being the user for it. You know, so I try to use Gumroad at least once a month to sell something so I can go through the experience. And what ends up happening a lot of the time is you go through and you're like, wow, this product sucks. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. My product sucks. And and sometimes you kind of forget about that because you're constantly designing with this, the this theory in mind, you know, as Josh kind of talked about. And the only way to kind of prove it is to build it. You know, Matt Mullenweg from WordPress has this amazing quote, which is, usage is like oxygen for ideas. You can theorize all you want, but you have no idea what's going to happen until people start using it um, and doing all these amazing things with it. So that's that's kind of how I think about it. I have this thing, which is if, if what we have on development, for example, locally is better than what we have in production and there's no regressions, that should never happen. It should be in production immediately because that's, you know, the faster that happens, the faster we can learn and fix and get better. And do you see technology sort of, you know, whether it's whether it's HTML5 or the CSS3 sort of speeding up that yeah. evolution process? Well, it totally does. I mean, you think of evolution... And it's, it's two things. It's trying a lot of things that are different and tr doing that really, really fast. That will lead to the perfect species or product or whatever. And tools like that really help. You know, For example, when I used to do a lot more mobile stuff, every button on the iPhone would have six different images. You, know, you would have the enabled, highlighted, and, highlighted and disabled state, and then you have the non-render and the render version. So if you want to change the word login to sign up, or sign in or something, it's gonna take you like 20 minutes to do that, or you wanna change the color, good luck. Um, and with things like HTML, CSS3, like I only design, I actually design most of my stuff using the inspector in Safari. So I will, you know, I will put the elements in, in HTML, and then I'll just click on them in the inspector and design them in. And then, you know, some, there's so many times where I'll accidentally delete something, like I'll delete a property that I didn't mean to delete, I'm like, wow, that looks so much better. And, and it sticks, and that's, you know, that's, that's probably how most of my design happens, is just like doing, seeing the changes immediately. Has is that, is that driven your changes, like sort of, you would assume, okay, I can follow these three, four, five steps, I can, put, I can build this in Photoshop, and I can put it out there, and that will work, versus in code. Has, has it, you know, working that way, has that changed sort of where you start from, like your starting point of assumptions? Yeah, it definitely does. I think I start off, I, I try not to open Photoshop. I see how long I can get through the day without opening it up. Um, it kind of is a test for myself, but t when users use your product, they're using it on the web or on mobile, right? So when you're designing it, why don't you use it the same way? Why don't you just design it in Safari or, you know, I also code for iOS, so I, I code in iOS directly. And the great thing with iOS that I think the web lacks, which I think Bootstrap and other things like that great is they have, you have these kind of standards that have kind of happened, you know, emerged organically or not. And it makes it really easy, you know, users know how a table view is gonna look on the iPhone. They know how it's gonna scroll. They know how buttons are gonna react and things like that. And when you're messing around with Photoshop all the time, you lose a lot of these constraints that you, and you kind of, you're like, you know, I have this thing which gummer at every single rounded corner is four pixels. And it's great because in Photoshop, sometimes I'll, you know, maybe I was working on something else and it was five pixels and then like, things look weird on, you know, on HTML that never happens because there's just one class rounded, which does everything. Um, but it helps, it helps a lot. But sometimes you have, so you're, you know, there's defaults yeah. that help the users know what's going on. And then, you know, sometimes you want to, you choose to stand out by yeah. going against the default. Yes. Right? So fonts are a good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you could talk about sort of leveraging a default versus, yeah. versus not, you know, Facebook, when you're, in, when you're in Safari, it's one font. When you're on yeah. Windows, it's another. I, I, I sway towards defaults because the more the user has to learn, the more they have to think about, the more questions they're going to ask, the more chance they have of never using your product because it confuses them too much. Um, yeah, I think one of the coolest things about Facebook is they love defaults. You know, If you use it on a Windows computer, the font is different than if you use it on a Mac computer because it makes it feel so much like, I think, a more native app. And it's what people are used to. You know, if, if, you know, 
if you're designing an iPhone app, the standard font you use, or at least I use, is Helvetic and you because that's the entire operating system is that. And if you kind of switch it up on a user, it might make your app look more you know beautiful or whatever. But it's like you know the user's going to be like, why is this font rounded? I'm so used to this this font that I'm you know I'm totally used to. Um, and and that I I always sway towards defaults. I I don't think defaults are always a great thing. Pull to refresh wasn't a default um, for a while. Um, and that's that's a gut thing I think. If you th if you truly think that like this new interaction is worth learning for a user, you should do it. Um, and you can always try it out. And if it doesn't work, you can kill it. And how, but how do you decide sort of where to pick your battles? Right, because it feels like you're sort of saying I want to I'm going to teach the user. There's some amount of learning that a user yeah. will do, and then sort of once you get beyond that, they abandon. And so sort of how yeah. do you figure out? Okay, this is this is something that's worth forcing them to do something different. Yeah, I think it's a lot of gut. I think it's a lot of what you believe. You you know, sometimes if you really believe in something, you should push really hard for it. You could argue that a lot of startups, for example, you know, it took many years to work. And if they didn't believe in a concept, you know, hard enough, they would have stopped working on it like a day before it would have taken off or something. Um, and it, But it's also hard to argue, argue the other way, which is people have slaved over certain concepts that have never taken off and they continue to do so. And it's really like if you believe in something so much, I think you should do it. Um, and eventually you stop believing or you die. Um, and if you die, it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I believe like that selling stuff should be simpler, faster, more accessible. And that's battle I'm always going to fight. You know, there's things with with selling stuff, for example, that I'm learning like where bad design actually increases conversions. And that's a tough battle to fight because you're like, well, I want good design, I want simpler design, I want less elements on the screen, but it actually loses money for people. Like that's kind of hard to deal with as a designer. Um, and it's it's like do we do we use do we show all the credit cards that we accept because that increases conversion or do we think of something new or do we just you know disregard it and say hey people are going to learn that we don't, we just accept all credit cards but there's 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 so much context that I think every every situation is unique and I think if you're you know I've been designing I guess for like six seven years now you just learn you kind of have this gut instinct on what what battles are worth fighting and and you know which ones aren't and and so six years ago you sort of picked design as a craft that was yeah. going to be your way to kind of leave a mark totally. on the world. And and so maybe just in closing, you could talk about kind of that decision, how you chose that craft versus yeah. math or something else. Yeah, so I think the the, the, the thing I wanted to do was I, I wanted to leave a mark on the world. I didn't really want to be replaceable. I wanted to invent, I guess, is, is the word people use there. It doesn't really fit as much, I think. Um, and you know you can invent in physics, you can invent in math, you can invent in academia, you can invent in finance, law. But for me, it's like I wanted to do it now. I wanted to figure out if I was good at something really quickly, and design felt like the easiest way to do that. You know, in math, I was like, I would have to be really, really smart, and I would have to work really, really hard, and I might have to work twenty years to get to something where I'm like marginally, you know, increase some proof validity or something. Um, and with design, it's not like that. Like, you can sit at your computer, you know, pull to refresh was invented by one dude who thought it was a good idea, and now it's probably going to make a mark on the world forever. And that's that's really cool. The, the potential of that impact and how easy it is to have that impact, it was a no-brainer to me.